Hi, my name is Deb Nam Crane, and I am the team leader of our poorly named soil carbon team. We are totally looking not only for other members, but for better names. So, you know, just hit me with it in the chat if you'd like. Um, I have so much to say about compost, uh, but I'm going to let Miranda say all that. The, the, the one thing I think I should say is that if you think gardening is hard, compost is easier by like a factor of 50 and like super satisfying. And then you'll also find that your gardening massively improves once you start composting. Um, also want to say that Miranda's presentation uh, several months ago at my synagogue in Brookline is actually one of the things that set me off on this journey to, hey, I think Jay can need some kind of like soil agriculture team because she presented some really fascinating information. And I think you guys are going to be like really excited to hear some of it. Um, I am now going to unmute, maybe, oh, yes, um, unmute Rabbi Bernhold. I tried, I tried to unmute you. There, okay, no, no, yeah, I did. Um, so that he can give us um, a quick Savar Torah, kind of set the context for like how this fits in overall into what we're doing, no pressure at all. And uh, then Miranda will present and hoping that we, um, hoping that everyone can hold questions until after that, feel free to put them in the chat. I will grab them and try to get them as sequentially as I can. Um, one more thing I wanted to say, we're having Michael, actually, Rabbi Bernholt is hosting a webinar for us on May 13th, talking about doing this in synagogues and other goodies. So please join us for that. We'll also have another webinar last week of May. I'll send out information about that as well. And with that, turning it over to Rabbi Bernholt. So and, and we talked about this a few different times, Deb, and I was like, I'm always going to forget. I'm going to keep forgetting. I'm going to keep forgetting. So now I remember we did mention to me multiple times that yes, to open with some words of Torah. And I even remember what we discussed as words of Torah to open this. Um, and so one of the pieces that as we're talking about soil and compost that always sets it as a Jewish value is a reminder that as human beings, where do we come from? That, and I always quote, that I think it's a Jeff Klepper song, that God took clay from Earth's four corners and gave it the breath of life. And I sing that to my kids in my religious school and our cancer grimaces and our educator grimaces, and I keep singing it anyway. But if we think about who we are as human beings, we see it in Genesis that God took clay from Earth's four corners, giving it the breath of life, bringing heaven and earth, bringing the concrete, um, and the spiritual into contact with each other, and that as we start now talking about that idea of how do we have healthy soil, that's exactly what we're now doing, is taking that sense of heaven and earth combined in us, and then how do we then relate to the soil underneath and give it that breath of life so that it can keep that energy flowing, the energy of the divine that's flowing into us, so we can take care of, of the earth so it can then sustain us. And so we, as God breathed life into us, we think about how we can take care of the life that's in the soil. Amen. Oh, and I'm also, in two weeks, um, Jewish uh, garden concepts, in case you're curious, um, how do we not just plant plants? How do we not just say, oh, I would like a tomato, or I would like a chickpea, or I would like to grow this or that? but how do we take Jewish values and plant a garden to help us tell a Jewish story or to live out a Jewish value? And so I will be um, not just talking about how to do that, but a lot of different um, brainstorms that I've come up with with different sets of gardens that um, you can plant that you can use to create to tell a Jewish story or live out a Jewish value. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. And now, um, Going to Miranda, and it's all you. Awesome. Can you all hear me? <laughs> um, cool. So my name is Miranda, um, and I work for Beatstrap Compost. Um, we are food waste haulers in the greater Boston area and Providence. Um, and today I'm going to go over kind of just 
the process of composting and really kind of dive into why it's so good for the environment and specifically why it's really good to foster life within our soil, whether that soil is in, you know, a house plant that you have um, or a backyard garden, or if you have access to, you know, a full on farm and land, um, compost can really help um, no matter what plants and what scale you're growing at. Um, so at Bootstrap, um, just, a little bit about us. We collect food waste from about 3,500 different households um, throughout the greater Boston area. And we bring everything to an industrial composting facility um, in Saugus, it's Rocky Hill Farm. Um, we haul about 8,000 to 10,000 pounds of food waste there every single day. Um, they make the finished compost for us and then we deliver that back to our customers free of charge because we say if they're giving us um, all this really amazing material that we need to be making this compost, we're just going to give it back to them um, to help them grow plants. So we've been around for between nine, nine and ten years. I can't remember which one. Um, and in that time frame, we have composted about 5.5 million pounds of food waste and organic material that has created about 2.7 million pounds of finished compost. And through the process of composting, we have helped prevent um, almost 4 million pounds of greenhouse gases from being emitted into the atmosphere. So I like to start off all of my presentations with talking about why, what happens to food waste when you put it into a landfill? Because that's what the majority of people in this country do. Um, you know, whenever you put something in your trash can, um, it all goes to a landfill. And in the state of Massachusetts, at least, I know that almost, I think all of the landfills that we have here are um, going out of business or turning into incineration sites. So that means that everything that you put in your trash can is either burned or it is getting talked out of state to a different landfill somewhere else where it's inevitably impacting um, you know, the environment of a different place. So here's a little infographic from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. Um, and at the bottom, you can see that um, every year uh, and trash incinerators receive 167 million tons of garbage, um, which is just a crazy amount of garbage that we are producing in this country. Um, and about it's estimated that over 50% of that is actually compostable material. So you can see here um, in this little diagram of a trash bag, um, it's estimated that 21% of everyone's trash is food waste, 15% is paper, 8% um, is yard trimmings, and another 8% is wood waste. So if we can just reduce the size of our trash by 50%, not only is that good for a person bringing their trash out all of the time, um, you know, you would in theory have to bring your trash out, you know, half, the amount of time that you're currently doing so. Um, but it means that we can reduce the size of landfills by 50%. So here we have a diagram of a landfill. Um, and so I don't know if anyone's had the luxury of going to a landfill in their life, but I did in college and it was quite a not very glorious and glamorous experience. <laughs> Um, but landfills are massive um, and the way that they work is they have all these layers underneath to prevent any toxins or leachate from going from the landfill into the surrounding environment. Um, and then when a landfill is full, it gets sealed off from the natural world. Um, so essentially no oxygen can get in and nothing can really get out. So if you have 50% of your landfill that is made up of organic material that is decomposing without oxygen, it's called anaerobic decomposition. Um, and when food waste uh, decomposes anaerobically, it produces methane. And methane is a really harmful greenhouse gas that's about 25 times more potent in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So here in the corner, you can see that the EPA um, estimates that municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of human-related methane emissions in the U.S., which accounts for approximately 16% of methane emissions um, in 2016. So that is, you know, four years old, but I'm sure that that number has um, not really changed all that much in the past four years, unfortunately. So what happens with that methane in landfills is older landfills will have these 
um, pipes that just come out of the landfill and the methane will just be emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and some more modern landfills have what's called a landfill gas conversion center, which you can see here in the corner. Um, and in that system, the methane is taken from the landfill and it's you, it goes back into the grid in the form of energy. So oftentimes that means that the methane can be used to power, um, you know, the facilities at the landfill itself. Um, if that landfill is producing a ton of methane, sometimes the energy gets used in a local town or something like that. Um, and that's all really great. You know, we want to be able to not put that methane into the atmosphere. Um, but for me, um, just the fact that 50% of the landfills are made up of organic waste that could be composted, if we can just increase the size of our landfills by up to 50% and not be producing methane to begin with, then that's kind of the, um, you know, that's the solution to the problem. Um, taking that methane and using it as energy is definitely something better than emitting it into the atmosphere, but it's not really solving the problem, um, you know, in the first place. So I like to go over a little bit about the process of composting, just because it's so different than, you know, what happens in a landfill, which is where basically food waste and organic material, they go to landfills and they don't do anything productive. They don't do anything good for the environment. Um, and the process of composting is pretty much the exact opposite. So we have a little recipe for compost. Um, Sometimes people view compost as this really daunting task. Um, and I totally see that if you have a backyard and you don't really know how to, how to get it started. Um, but really, if you just follow a simple recipe, um, it's not all that hard. Um, so that recipe that we follow is three part brown materials to one part green materials. And what that means is your brown materials are really rich in carbon. So that's dried up leaves or wood chips or cardboard and your green materials are really rich in nitrogen. So that's basically all of your food waste and any um, like yard trimmings or weeds, if you're weeding your garden, um, if they're like freshly pulled out of the ground and they're still green, then they're nitrogen. But if you let them sit there and dry out, they become a brown or a carbon material. And so what you're looking for in this ratio is you're basically creating the perfect home for different microbes and different organisms to come and break everything down for you. Um, because at the end of the day, composting is a really natural process. You know, if you um, dig a hole and put a banana peel in it in your backyard, if you come back in a month, that banana peel is probably going to be gone. Um, and that's just kind of like composting in nature. So what you're doing in a compost pile is you're just mimicking this natural process and you're helping it along a little bit um, with a couple extra ingredients. So the two other ingredients besides carbon materials and nitrogen materials are oxygen and water. So whereas in a um, landfill, if you, when it's sealed off and everything is decomposing anaerobically without oxygen, in a compost pile you're doing the exact opposite. So you want everything to decompose aerobically or with oxygen. And you basically just do that by turning your compost pile. So in a larger uh, municipal composting facility, you'll see you know, really big tractors doing that for you. Um, but if you're composting in your backyard, you can just achieve adding oxygen to your pile by turning your pile with a pitchfork. Um, and the reason why you want to add oxygen is because you have all of this life living in your compost pile. It's really, it's like teeming with organisms and every living being needs oxygen in order to breathe, even the living beings that we can't even see. So by turning your pile, you're adding oxygen to like the centermost part um, that isn't, you know, doesn't have to be air. Um, the last ingredient is water. So everything needs a little bit of moisture in order to decompose and really break down. And in a larger composting facility, um, you're not gonna see someone there like with a hose, like hosing everything down um, just because you know they get water from the rain. Um, but in a backyard pile, you may need to hose down your, hose it down every week or so if you notice it's getting a little bit dry. Um, and the water just kind of helps break everything down, helps everything get moving a little bit. Um, and then you just give it time. You let it mix and mingle. And for us, it takes about three months to make finished compost. But in a backyard compost pile, it may take, you know, all summer. Um, it really depends on the system that you have. 
Um, but it doesn't really matter how long it takes for your compost to, um, you know, become finished compost because at the end of the day, you're left with this really incredible product that is extremely, extremely good um, for the environment. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about compost and agriculture and go into, um, you know, carbon sequestration and, you know, how compost can really help the environment. Um, so the way that you, in order to understand this, you need to understand how you use finished compost. And so the way you use compost is as a soil amendment. So you're never going to take a plant and put it in a bucket of compost, um, or like in a bucket that's 100% finished compost because compost isn't soil. Um, it's like this really, really rich, um, nutrient rich and microbially rich soil amendments. So you only need about a quarter of an inch to half an inch of it either over the top of your soil if you already have an established plant or if you're doing new planting you can mix that equivalent into your soil mix or your potting mix. Um, and so that's really not that much and the idea with finished compost is that you're inoculating your soil with life and with nutrients in order to help your plants grow. Um, and really the philosophy here is that, um, you know, humans all need healthy plants in order to survive and healthy plants need healthy soil in order to survive. So by putting compost on your soil, you're helping, you know, increase the health of your soil. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about industrial agriculture and kind of what that system looks like so that we can really compare it to um, regenerative agriculture and what a more thriving uh, agriculture system looks like. So the Marin Carbon Project, which is based in California, estimates that one third of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has come from agriculture and land management practices. So those land management practices that you'll see in industrial, industrial system, especially the industrial system we have in this country, is tilling your land a lot. So turning your soil over oftentimes many times a year in order to plant new crops. Um, deforestation in order to, you know, cutting down an entire forest to make room for um, another, a farm um, or, or, you know, just development. Um, Overgrazing monocrops. So monocrops is just growing one thing, like just growing corn, just growing soybeans on your land, um, which really depletes the soil of nutrients because that one crop is taking in the same nutrients season after season from the soil. So the UN estimates 60 years of farmable topsoil left in the world. Um, and the topsoil is that, you know, it's like maybe the top two or three inches of your soil profile and it's the part of your soil that has the most life and the most nutrients in it. And without topsoil, um, you really can't farm productively. So in a regenerative agriculture system, what that would look like is either having uh, like not tilling at all or having minimal tillage. Um, in a regenerative system, you're promoting biodiversity on your land and within your soil by, you know, doing companion planting or by planting cover crops so that you have some growing on your land year round. Um, if you don't have anything growing in your soil, um, then your soil, the life within your soil kind of dies a little bit. So it's really important that you have something growing year round, even in the winter, um, if it's a cover crop that like dies, as long as there are roots there in the soil, the soil is staying alive. Um, Regenerative ag can also um, look like rotational grazing. Um, if you have cattle or something like that, um, I don't think, I don't, I wouldn't assume that anyone here in this uh, right now is, you know, a cow farmer. <laughs> um, I would assume we're all kind of backyard gardeners and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, what regenerative agriculture is, is you're farming for the soil and you're doing carbon farming and one really, really great way that you can do that um, is by adding compost to your soil. It's this really, really simple act that can have so, so many benefits to the environment and to your plants. So one of those benefits is water retention. So if anyone has ever like forgotten about a house plant or forgotten to water a plant on your desk at work um, and you go in and you water it and all that water kind of just sits there on the top. 
um, and takes a really long time to kind of go into the soil profile. That's essentially what a conventional agriculture system is doing. So you can see here the image on the right hand side is soil taken from a conventional system. And that soil looks really muddy. Um, it looks even, or like the water looks muddy, sorry, but the soil, like it looks kind of dry and it's just sitting there in a clump on the bottom. And what that means is all that water that all that rainfall that goes onto your farmland, if it just runs off into local waterways, it's gonna bring all that topsoil with it. And it's gonna bring all those nutrients and all those microorganisms with it into the waterways. So we're seeing really, really bad water, um, like problems with water ecosystems right now due to runoff from industrial agriculture. And you know, in that runoff from industrial agriculture, you also have all these artificial and synthetic nutrients um, and pesticides that go with it and harm aquatic ecosystems. So here, the image on the left hand side shows a soil aggregate from an organic system and an aggregate is basically just like a clump of soil. And if you're ever digging around in your garden and you notice that there's your soil has a lot of aggregates, it's actually a really good sign. Um, it means you have a really high percent of organic matter. And so what you can see here is that that soil is staying put. Um, no water is like gonna get, gonna run off into local eco waterways. Um, and that soil, that soil is actually gonna be able to absorb rainwater. Um, and so that water can then go through the soil profile and replenish um, groundwater resources, which is really, really important. So the Rodale Institute, which is based down in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, um, they say that 15 to 20% more water percolates through the soil of an organic ecosystem. Um, so if we can just ha be replenishing our groundwater resources by 15 to 20%, um, that is huge because we all rely every single day when you turn on your faucet or you turn on your shower. That is relying on a groundwater resource. So if by adding compost, we can just like help, um, help your soil retain more water, that's really, really huge. So the next really big thing is um, nutrients and microbiology. So there's a lot of um, research out there that shows that, um, yes, your plants need nutrients in order to survive. And you definitely see that in industrialized agriculture where people are putting a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus on their soil and on their land. Um, but there's a growing body of research right now that's showing that, yes, you, your plants certainly need nutrients in order to survive. But the way that your soil functions and the way that it works is that if there's no life within your soil, those nutrients can actually just lie there unavailable for plant roots to even take in. So what we have here is a kind of a diagram of the soil food web. So remembering back to, you know, your carbon and your nitrogen that you have in your compost pile, all that carbon and all that nitrogen is in your finished product as well. And you also have all of this life, because remember, your compost pile is breaking down through the use, through microorganisms, essentially. Um, so you have protozoa and nematodes and worms and millipedes living in your compost and breaking everything down. And when you put your compost on your land or on your plants, you're basically inoculating your soil with all of that life. So essentially what we have here um, and what is created is like this entire network of fungus underground. It's called mycorrhizal fungi. And what happens here is um, without this fungal network, you really can't have a plant that is growing in a healthy way. Um, and I think this next slide kind of says it all. Um, so basically you have um, all plants photosynthesize, right? So plants will take in carbon dioxide and they will release oxygen. And what happens is that carbon dioxide goes through the leaves of the plant. Um, I'm going to go back to this one because I kind of like this image on the right a little bit better. Um, but your plants will, um, that carbon dioxide will go through the leaves of the plant and through the stem and into the roots. And 